How about that cigar? How about that cigar? Well, guys, it's our favorite night of the week. It is Tuesday night. It is January 7th. It is 2020. Can you believe it? 2020. I know. I forgot this was the first show of the year. I know. First show of 2020. Guys, we're so appreciative that you are here watching live on Facebook. And for those of you watching after the fact on YouTube and Facebook, thanks very much for joining us. And especially if you guys are listening on the audio podcast, we want to thank you for listening to us while you drive down the road or while you work out, whatever it is you do while you listen to audio podcasts. Thanks so much for joining us. This is episode number 41 41. of How About That Cigar. We're so grateful to you guys for a great 2019. We're looking forward to an awesome 2020. It's shaping up to be a great one. And... If you guys missed it on the 30th, we did a special show on a Monday night last week where we went through our picks for the cigars that we reviewed over the course of 2019. We put them in a little bit of an order and we had our top 10 cigars of the year list. If you guys missed that show, check it out. It's on uh, it's on our Facebook page. It's on our YouTube channel and it's on the audio podcast as well. So, Garrett, our teams Ah. are both in the playoffs. And uh, we we had uh, quite the game. The Minnesota Vikings, yeah, upset the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, that was that was. Uh, I mean, so I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. You're a Minnesota Vikings yep. fan, but we're also fans of the game. We, we just are. love the game, yep. and that was a great football game to watch. Yeah, it really was. Yeah, um, it, obviously for me, it was uh, <clears throat> an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, I heard you. So you were. So we're here. Um, uh, as always, it's uh, Sodi Cigar and Pipe in just outside of Stillwater, Minnesota. Yep. Uh, and and this is, you know, w- a place you can come and, you know, watch some TV, watch the game, whatever it yep. is. And I heard you were making a little bit of a... We had some noises going on. A little on. bit of noises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the people here make faces when Garrett makes yeah. the Vikings horn. But uh, it was a great game to watch. Um, guys, we want to remind you, as always, we are brought to you by um by drew estate cigars and we are here in the drew estate studios at Sodi cigar and pipe and drew estate just announced that they are going to be reopening the cigar safari program oh wow it is the ultimate experiential cigar tour of esteli nicaragua hosted at la gran fabric of drew estate for four days and three nights the 2020 season will be used as an incubator season for a variety incubator. of planned enhan- enhancements and limited to only five trips these enhancements will be fully unleashed during the 2021 season since 2008, Drew Estate has been the industry leader in cigar tourism through their Cigar Safari program. C- cigar Safari represents an opportunity for consumers and retailers to take a once-in-a-lifetime trip to Drew Estate's Nicaraguan Cigar Factory and explore the ecotourism of Nicaragua. At La Grand Fabric of Drew Estate, guests learn the entire process of creation from seed to cigar, including seed. the magic experience of blending their own cigars. While visiting Subculture Studios, attendees will have Drew Estate's very own art team, custom paint an item of their choosing. The experience is truly unforgettable and unique among cigar manufacturers. For more info, please visit CigarSafari.com. Mm. Um, so, yeah, this weekend, you guys get to face uh, the San Francisco 49ers. We do. We it should, to... should be an easy game. I mean, San Francisco's... Yeah, so yeah, I, th- I think it's no problem. Jimmy G. Right. Or whatever. I- I'll say that if they do some of the same switch ups, you know, they switched up some coverages. They move some of their, their outside linebackers inside. If they do some more of that, I think they have a really good chance, actually, against San Francisco. I do, you know, and um, I know it's going to be a, a close game. Yeah. Um, it's obviously I'm I don't know if I'm more worried than I was for New Orleans than I am for San Francisco, but either way, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a tough game. That's, that's for sure. Well, and for my Packers, you know, against the the Seahawks, we haven't necessarily, it's, we're, we're a pretty evenly matched team. Um, and historically the Packers have struggled mightily against running quarterbacks, but Russell doesn't run the way he used to. No. And I don't foresee him running a whole lot in yeah. the cold either, but I don't think so. And temperatures are dropping like yep. crazy. It's in close to single digits here now, and the temperatures from here are going to be, you know, moving that direction over to Green Bay, you know, within the next few days. So, and you've had a week off to, you know, rest a lot of your your guys that needed the rest. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Yeah. 
it's it's going to be a fun weekend of football. We uh, we encourage you guys out there in the cigar community, go out to your brick and mortar shops, sit down with friends, make new friends, buy some cigars and sit down and enjoy those games together with people at, at your local cigar shops. It's you know, it's one of the one of the most fun things you can do is sit down and watch Absolutely. games at a cigar shop. Yep. Um, so, guys, we have a great special guest this evening. Uh, special guest segment, as always, is brought to you by Corona Cigar Company and CoronaCigar.com. They are the Internet's largest and easiest to use virtual cigar store. Corona Cigar Company offers you the finest handmade cigars, humidors, and cigar accessories at the absolute lowest possible price. At Corona Cigar Company, they take pride in being cigar fanatics just like you and me. That is why you will find the best selection of rarest and finest premium cigars available anywhere in the world. You will also find unique and limited cigars containing Florida sun-grown tobacco. As a proud American... President and founder of Corona Cigar Company, Mr. Jeff Borshowitz, believed it was possible to bring cigar tobacco farming back to Florida. At Corona Cigar Company and CoronaCigar.com, you'll find the best selection anywhere in the world of cigars containing this special Florida sun-grown tobacco. If you live in Florida or are just visiting, please be sure to visit any of the great Corona Cigar locations in downtown Orlando, Sand Lake, Lake Mary, and also the Davidoff of Geneva Lounge in Tampa. For more info on all of that, please visit coronacigar.com and floridasungrown.com. And guys, without further ado, we're not going to wait any longer. We have a great first special guest of 2020 and from Alec Bradley Cigar Company, owner and founder and president of Alec Bradley Cigars, Mr. Alan Rubin. Welcome. Guys, to the show. How are you? How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, we're doing fantastic. Super. Thanks so much for being on the show with us. So we... We really were uh, were excited when we uh, were able to get you on the show because we know that uh, life gets really busy, especially around the holidays. But fortunately, everybody's got just a little bit of breathing time, you know, in this this early time of January before things start ramping up again for 2020. Yeah. Um, give us uh, give us a little bit of an idea about, you know, because if you go back in your, you know, in, in your cigar life, you know, early on. Uh, before you got into cigars, in, as far as a business, you were in the fastener business. Is that correct? That's correct. So, yeah. give us a little bit of, a, of of an idea how you what led to that transition from the fastener business into the cigar business. Yeah, I mean bolts, nuts, and screws right into uh, tobacco is a natural segue. I don't know if you <laughs> see that, but absolutely, <laughs> people know that. <laughs> Let me let me start by saying first and foremost, uh, I'm a Packers fan too. I'm born and raised in Miami, but I grew up a, a Packers fan because of Lombardi. But the truth is, Russell Wilson was tearing off 20 yard runs at a time. So I'm not yeah. sure your point of him not running is going to happen. If there's well, an opening, I think he'll take it. Maybe that's just I maybe, agree. maybe that's just false hope on my part. Yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> and I do think the weather does play in the Packers' uh, benefit. Huge but, flavor. Yeah. 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 Ho hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. So back to your question. Um, I was in the fastener business after Hurricane Andrew hit uh, in the early 90s down in South Florida. I turned the company to uh, hurricane fasteners, hurricane protection products. And that industry was growing rapidly and we kind of grew along with it. And there was a four or five year period that um, we, we, we doubled our business every year for four or five years. And um, somebody had approached us to uh, want to, you know, purchase our company. We had even picked up Home Depot as an account. So we were growing. We were well known in the industry. And uh, someone approached us and said, hey, we, we'd like to buy the company. And uh, I wasn't very passionate about bolts, nuts and screws, but it, it paid the bills. And um, it just someone had asked me, what do you want to do next? And I always love cigars. And I, I used to light up a cigar at seven o'clock in the morning with a cup of coffee and heading to work. And I just thought, you know, I'll, I'll give it a try. So uh, it went from a hobby to just trying to get into the business. And uh, I went with a friend of mine who was a tobacconist. And I said, do you guys have a trade show? He said, yes. Yeah. I said, can I, can I join you as a guest? And he allowed me to do so. And from the second you walk in, uh, it was called the RTDA back then, but with the second you walk in, you just felt a great vibe of the people. I'd been to other trade shows where people don't talk to one another, but everyone here said hello and gave everyone hugs and sharing cigars. And I'd already loved the history of, of the cigar business. And um, I, I was kind of a student of that side of it. And it didn't take long. After two or three days, I knew this is what I wanted to do next. 
Yeah. So early on, you, um, I know you did the, there was something, if I remember this right, because I did a little research, or if I remember, you did a little thing called bogey stogies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then when you, and then you moved into, and you, you started working with one of the Davidoff factories, if I'm correct. Um, correct. And you, you, you made a cigar called Occidental Reserve. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Now, I have to tell you, even to this day, that is one of my favorite cigars on the shelf. And it's still out in the, it's still out there. So we, yeah. we launched that in the very end of 1999. Um, and it's still in the market today. So it's, it's, it's just a kind of a quiet hit, it just does its thing. And people who are fans of that cigar uh, are loyal to it. So, yeah. Um, so over time, you know, things started with the brand and then gradually you ramped up, you develop blends, you, you know, all the things that happen with any kind of new business, you develop new products, you figure out how to release those new products, how to source the materials to make the products, things like that. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the, the strategy for building the profile of cigars on, you know, under the Alec Bradley flag. How did you, you know, once once you realized you had something, you know, how did you go about deciding you were going to build a profile facing by facing? Well, I'm not sure that uh, it, it, you can have all the strategy you want, but truly the consumers tell you where you need to go or what they're looking for from you. OK. And so um, we had some things that had worked in our favor. Um, we had a product that people gravitated to called Trilogy which was a triangle press cigar that we did. And it gave us a tremendous amount of exposure and brought a lot of accounts uh, into our company. And so people took notice of us because of Trilogy. So we had that. Uh, we had Max and Max is still on the market today, but we were one of the first companies to do all larger engaged cigars. And it was actually delayed. Max was delayed uh, just over a year from the time we were originally gonna launch it. And so we had, and all the cigars sold for $5 at retail, no matter what size. Oh, wow. So yeah, 60 by six and three eighths. There was a, a 50, I think by nine and a quarter. There were just all these very large sizes. Yeah. And so people, we did some things to make people take notice and uh, started to build a good reputation for making good cigars at a good price. And uh, ultimately it led to, we were working with a factory called Rice's Cubanas and we were doing some projects with them. And there was a tobacco that they were developing um, a, a Criollo 98 seed out of, uh, uh, out of the Trojes area of Honduras, which is the Nicaraguan Valley that runs through Honduras. And we fell in love with the tobacco and that was the beginning of the Tempest line, which is our first high, you know, highly rated cigar and truly what put us on the map as a company. Awesome. And uh, I just want to point out uh, Matt and I have just lit up the Alec Bradley Magic Toast, a beautiful chocolatey Maduro treat. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's like Oreo cookie dark. It's just yeah. it's got it's got tooth and depth and yeah, it's it's good right off the bat. Yep, it is That's awesome. Great. And uh, Alan, what are you smoking? Um, I'm smoking a Tempest Natural now. That's the okay. that's the cigar. Like I said, that kind of made people take notice of our company. Uh, and I'm going to follow that up as soon as I'm finished with um, our new release of our of our fine and rare. So um, very cool. Generally, because we sell out, the fine and rare sells out in in, in a week or so. Um, I generally, I, I ask them to send me the seconds. You know, the stuff that wasn't the right oh, wrapper yeah. color. <laughs> <laughs> but this time, I actually asked them to make me some. Uh, so, uh, and the reason is is because. Um, this is this cigar is an homage to my father who passed recently, and uh, mm -hmm. I worked alongside my father for over thirty five years in the the bolt nut and screw business, and then he worked with me here, yeah, in the in the cigar business, and uh, I just wanted to honor him. So, and I, I I personally think it's probably the best cigar we've ever made. So, um, I, I sit out at night and uh, and have uh, one of my Glenn Fittix and, and smoke a, a fine and rare. So, yeah. And it's, I mean, you, you put your, uh, you put your dad's picture on that, uh, on that mm -hmm. cigar band. And I remember when the press release came out about that and what, uh, I mean, it's, I, I don't want to get too, um, 
you know, uh, transcendental or anything like that. But the fact is, it's almost as though you can, you know, you, you, it's almost as though even, even though he's gone, you can, you can sit down and have a cigar with your dad again, you know, I, just having a picture on that band there. And yeah. And I, I have to tell you every, every time I light it up, um, I, I actually look at the band and, oh, uh, yeah. Just think about all the memories and all the stories and all the fun times and all the struggles you know everything um my dad was a he was one of the old you know tough guys you know he was born in the late 20s and he he had a work ethic like no one else i ever knew and um i, I believe he tried tried to instill in me that there's nothing you can't do if you just focus down and work hard yeah and so when i sit down at night with the cigar that honors my dad it just tells me hey you know you did okay today during the day so yeah that's awesome and alan you are so family oriented um you know for the longest time uh, i'm no i'm not alone in thinking you know alec bradley cigars there's an alec bradley around there somewhere <laughs> you know that this was named after i know that this particular subject has probably been beaten with a horse but just to get it over with um can you quickly just uh share that process of um, you know, the naming and all of that. And yeah, that actually, uh, a lot of that came from my father as well. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he used to tell me if you're ever going to start a company, start it with the letter a, cause it's at the front of the yellow pages. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, it's simple, I but that's a great strategy. advice. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then the other was a story when I was back in grade school. Um, I remember walking from, you know, when you're, in fourth and fifth grade, whatever you, you line up in a single file line to walk to the cafeteria, that type of thing. And I remember being in a line walking from my class to the cafeteria and I saw this big box truck and it was my father's company. He was actually doing some work for the school, uh, excuse me, for the school. And uh, it was called Princess Cabinets, but uh, it said Gloria Allen Industries. And so I didn't know what that was. And I got home that night and I said, Dad, I saw our truck. I was so excited. I said, but what is Gloria Allen Industries? She said, well, my partner and I decided to make you know, the name of the corporation after our two youngest children. And so I saw my name on the truck. It just you know, made me proud that my dad wanted to do that. And that was part of the impetus for me to mm -hmm. name the company after my kids, you know, Alec and Bradley, so. Fantastic. And we'll, uh, we're gonna get into their story a little bit more uh, in a little bit because it's mm -hmm. it's it's so awesome that they actually play a part in this whole story now but take us back to you know the the brand gains like you said it gains traction with tempest it gets a great score from cigar aficionado which is you know can be a great booster for any cigar brand mm -hmm. and you know especially a newer cigar brand uh, because you know a lot of people you know that a lot of smokers tend to tend to walk into a humidor in a in a shop and they they gravitate toward the brands they know the brands they smoke on a regular basis that they've seen they you know and when you get a shout out in a magazine like cigar aficionado or or from one of the big online um review sites it can really it, it can really bring attention to your brand so with tempest and then as the years went on you were it, if I'm not mistaken, you were in the cigar business full time for about 15 years. And then all of a sudden the white whale hits and you guys get, I mean, you, you guys get the, the, the king of all trophies. And that is you get the number one cigar of the year from cigar aficionado with the Prensado Churchill. So for a, for a young, I mean, this is an award that, that, you know, cigar companies with families who've been working with tobacco for generations upon generations upon even centuries sometimes mm -hmm. for a for a at the time a younger relatively young cigar company to get the number one cigar of the year what what kind of an impact did that have on you as a person what kind of an impact did it have on your family on your business on your consumers kind of tell us what that process was like for you when, when, when that's, when that white whale came your way. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a game changer uh, yeah. on every level. Um, you know, I remember the day it happened first and foremost, the manufacturer finds out at the same time everybody else finds out. 
So there's so, no early call from from cigar aficionado saying, "Hey, just to let you know, you you won this award, and we're going to announce it tomorrow or something like that." You get nothing. Oh, so, wow. um, you know, if you think about it, you start to go down the process of. I think it was like a Tuesday where they announced ten nine eight, and we're not there. And uh, you know, I remember coming into my office. And you could see people were a little upset or depressed or we weren't 10, 9 or 8. And, and I just I didn't pay any attention. And then the next day, 7, 6, 5, and we weren't there. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, 4, 3, 2. And so the only thing I'm thinking, because we're still a pretty young maker at that time, that on Monday when they were announcing the 11 to 25, I said, God, I really hope we're in there because it's yeah. still a great accolade and something we can build upon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, it was Friday morning. I was getting ready to go to work. And my wife said, you know, they're announcing number one today. And I said, listen, I said, historically, either Cuban brands or Cuban families have yeah. won the number one. And I'm not going to wait here. And she said, no, just, just wait and we'll get the, the computer and we'll refresh it. And I said, let me just go to work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, no, I want you to wait. And I think we called in Alec at the time and he brought his laptop and he just kept hitting refresh. And then uh, at 10 o'clock, we hit the button and Prince Otto was there. Uh, you know, I could. You, it's almost where the blood rushes out of your body. You, you start to think, what does this all mean? Yeah. Uh, and so and I've told the story on the way into work. I picked up two bottles of champagne. I never even knew liquor stores were open at 10 a.m and um picked up two bottles of champagne and brought it to the office and said this is for later but the work starts now and we got to go and keep going and uh it's it's definitely was it definitely changes your your perspective personally and professionally on things yeah because there's a there's a moment that you look up to those people who have started in the business making great cigars you know before you and you try and follow their model and understand what they're doing and you can't you don't want to copy but you'd like to emulate certain things that they do in oh, building absolutely. their brands yeah yep and so just to think that i was able to be in that group as a young cigar maker not of latin descent to 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 be a part of that was uh it was it was an amazing honor yeah and when the you know like you said you've got that that singular moment when it happens that you know the the blood rushes out of your body and and you you have to take it all in and realize what's what's actually going on but then you know as time goes on you've got um you, obviously consumers want to get their hands on that cigar mm -hmm. and was there a time during the process because i've heard this in some other interviews from from people who have you know, companies who have have uh, also been bestowed with that same honor. What did you have a period when, uh, during the process of of starting to work on uh, production for your retailers, did you have a, if you'll pardon the term, an oh shit moment during that, or did, were you just were you just saying okay? It's time to get it done. It's time to time to get to work. And, you know, we've got a lot to do, but we can totally do this. Um, I would say a it was okay. an oh shit moment <laughs> uh, pretty much but, every day. Now, did that oh shit moment happen at the same time? What was uh, was it within a few minutes after you the elation of winning? And then was that was that oh shit moment pretty recently, pretty soon after that elation? Well, again, you know, we were, you know, we're a smaller company. So I remember going and sitting in my office and the phones were ringing like Wall Street. I mean, it was just, you know, bye, bye, bye type of thing. And I shut my door and I just sat there and I was numb. I mean, I, I kept thinking to myself, what now? What what happens now? Because it's yeah. all new. Um, and so we didn't know how to handle certain things. And so we went down to the uh, a few weeks later we were out of inventory we were out of that size of prensado uh within a couple of hours okay. and so ultimately that means you let a lot of people down right because you have friendships that are are years long uh mm -hmm. from being in the business and people that trust you and believe in you and they've always been there for you and all of a sudden they call you know they you 
you get the call at 10, they're calling at three or calling the next day or calling at five, you know, five that night asking for, give me 10 boxes, give me 20 boxes and you're out. Yeah. And you really don't have anything to say to them. Yeah. yeah. And so ultimately where the mistakes ended up happening was I was called all over the place. I mean, I was called from the Honduran consulate uh, up in, up in DC to come and do dinners. I was called to do events all over the country. And at the end, I really took my eye off the ball when it came to the factory. And every time I'd say to the factory, can we do this? The answer was yes. And uh, when it wasn't. And so if we were ever fortunate to get number one cigar again in that in, in cigar aficionado, I would have, you know, we'll have changed a lot of things already. So we'll yeah. be a lot. We, we'd be a lot more prepared to handle people properly. Yeah. Well, and it's like anything, the consumers, because we focus so much on, you know, consumer education and, and things like that. And I think a lot of consumers don't realize that in, in any circumstance, it doesn't matter which brand it is, which, which facing from that brand it is within, within the snap of a finger, that one product, that one, and it's not just the one product, it's the one Vitola in that one facing mm -hmm. suddenly becomes the most sought after product in, in that category. Right. And, and it's, um, con consumers, you know, have to realize that, uh, it's, it, it, it may take time. You know, they may, they may be out of it right away. That's probably going to happen, but you'd be patient and you're going to see that product on the shelf again. And, um, fortunately, so, so actually, how did you, because like you said, you sold out of it within about an hour, what, what you had on hand of those mm -hmm. cigars ready to ship. You sold, sold out in about an hour. And then how did you go about the process of, you know, working with the factory and making sure, okay, they've got the, they've got the raw materials, the tobaccos they need to roll that cigar the right way. The, the bands are printed, the boxes are made, all that stuff. And is so we can actually make the product and ship more back to the States to send to our retail partners. How, you know, how did that process look for you? Was it a mad scramble or, or were you able to just deal with it and move on? No, it was a, it was a mad scramble because, okay. you know, we knew what our, let's say our box inventory was, we knew what our packaging, you know, our bands, we knew what the inventory was and, and realized that what we thought was a six month supply based on what we were seeing and the orders that were coming in over the first week was about a, was about a three to four week supply. And so immediately you're calling, you know, your printers asking for more product to be rushed. And then we had material issues where, you know, there are some tobaccos that were in Prensado that we also use in Tempest. And so um, we were saying, Hey, what materials do we have? What materials do we need without changing the blend and making sure we're doing it properly. But at the end, Ultimately, the demand was so high. I mean, we grew 65% that year. Wow. And, and we didn't have the processes in place to grow 65% in a year. So, it, 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 you know, all of our products ended up suffering to try and fill a demand, and we mm -hmm. didn't do that properly. But um, fortunately, and maybe it's just the benefit of premium cigars, that ultimately tobacconists and consumers have short memories. And they've given us, they've given us an opportunity to come back and reprove ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and, and we, we, we take that very seriously. So, well, sorry, go ahead. Gary. No, um, so as you were sitting kind of maybe in the, in the shadow of um, all of that, and you've figured out what you're going to figure out. What was the, the pressure or the thoughts that you had after that, the, for the next year, was there this, oh my gosh, I've got cigar of the year. Now I gotta, um, I gotta make another cigar or, you know, come up with something that is on par with that. There's all this, you know, what did that look like in, uh, in the aftermath? Yeah. I mean, look, every time we blend a lot here, I mean, we are almost continuously blending. Um, I mean, I think right now at the beginning of this year, we're, we're, we're working on 18 blends right now that we're trying to pare down for some projects and different things. And that process started, you know, last year. So we're always blending, but it's, it's really never about, we never blended for the ratings, right? We, right. we blend, we blend for our, for our, ourselves and we hope that the consumer likes it. 
And if you get the accolades, I think it's spectacular, but it, it, it's not what drove us. Um, I think for me, the dilemma that I was in personally was we just grew this amount. How do we sustain the sales? Yeah. Right. Because mm -hmm. you bring on people and you bring on, you know, you bring on more human resources, you make more investment in tobacco and all those things. So now you start to build, you know, a lot of inventory that you need to still sell. So I yeah. think the big issue is, was for me, was the dilemma of how are we keeping sales at this, at this certain level? Um, yeah. But with that, we never pushed a cigar out. We didn't believe it. We never blended and said, you know, can this be a number one cigar or can this be a top 25 cigar? Um, I think we were talking earlier and you said, you know, you're smoking, you were smoking project 40. If you think about that, I mean, that's a, that's a sub $6 cigar in terms of its price. And everyone's talking about it because it outperforms many cigars that are more expensive. That to me is more important than, mm. you know, what is the next accolade? Yeah. Um, a couple good questions in here that I want to bring in. One, one is just a comment and it, it's, it's, uh, it's our mutual friend, Jack. Jack says, whole lot of handsome in this dream. I guarantee he's talking about that end, not this end correct. here. So that thank you for that, Jack. You're a beautiful yes. man yourself. I love Jack. <laughs> I do. Jack is I one do. of the funniest people in the cigar business. Without question. Um, and this is a great question from Steve. Did you feel that the Prinsado was your best blend at that time? Uh, and how has that opinion changed over time with your portfolio? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, I actually didn't think that that cigar was any better than let's say tempest which is what really mm -hmm. put us on the map yep. yeah so it was a different profile it was sweeter uh probably a little bit smoother than tempest in terms of its style but no i didn't think it was you know better than anything else that we had made to be honest with you i mean i liked it i smoked it on a regular basis and i still do but if someone asked me which cigar was going to get number one i probably wouldn't have said any of ours but uh you know just because we weren't we weren't getting the accolades at that time um but you know i think i think tempest is as as good a cigar as we make so and then today i look at our portfolio is pretty vast right now we make some milder smoother connecticut cigars we make some stuff that's bolder you guys are smoking magic toast right now um you know, I, I think they're all on on that same part. We care about each of the products that we put our name on. Yeah. Um, so, like I I said, we're going to come back to this topic, and and now's the the best time to do it, I think. So, you named the company after your sons. Mm -hmm. You had an opportunity to work alongside your dad for many years. Mm -hmm. I have an 18 year old son and, and then uh, a 14 year old daughter and a 10 year old son and a 25 year old daughter. So I just, I think even me just thinking about the, the chance to work side by side with my own kids, uh, you know, gives me, you know, warm feelings. It just makes me feel Vomit. really good. So when you think about the fact that you named this company after your own sons and now for the last couple of years, and even maybe before that, you have the opportunity to work side by side with them in this business and see them grow not only as cigar guys, but see them grow as businessmen, to see them grow as men, as you know, character building and, and all the stuff that comes along with that. What I mean, I just I well up just thinking about it. What is that? What is that like for you? Uh, I mean, how rewarding is it? There, there obviously has to has to be challenges that come along with that too. But what is that? What is that like for you to be able to work side by side with with your own kids in this business that you put together? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say first and foremost, working alongside my dad for thirty five years um, with with the struggles, with the fights, where we didn't see eye to eye, but we were still father and son. Um, and, and I remember when I was in my 20s, when I started working with him, we would work alongside each other all day, drive home in different cars. I was living at home at the time. And I'd walk in and give my dad a kiss hello and ask him how his day was. Yeah. I mean, I, I just left him 10 minutes earlier. So um, there is a balance. And 
I mean, working with my kids is the, the greatest joy that I will ever receive, right? It's a chance to be involved with them every day, watch them, as you said, grow into men um, personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. So I get to be a part of their careers. I get to try and guide them in their careers, whether they take the advice or not. Yeah. And I've had to, I've had to learn to do more listening than talking. And they would never agree that that's how I feel, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, I mean, I get to kiss my kids hello every day. Yeah. Um, and you know, and goodbye. So it's, it's great. And it does have its challenges, right? When, when am I the boss and when am I the dad? And I have to hold them to a standard that is as high or higher than anyone else within our company. Yeah. Uh, that's not always so easy to do. Uh, sometimes you just want to say yes when they have a request to do something because you're the dad and you want them to do it. And sometimes it's not the best situation for the company, but we're learning to navigate that. Right. That's, that's not always so easy, yeah. but I also put a lot of pressure on them to perform. And there's things that, now, actually, almost, you know, now as we're talking, you know, the, it, it's right here, right now in the present is me telling them, hey, the things that I, I was doing are now things that I expect you to be doing. You've right. learned it. You've seen it. Instead of coming to me with a question, make sure you're coming to me with a question and your answer to that question as to what you think. And we can then discuss what you think versus maybe what I would do. And maybe what I would do is not correct. But we'll continue to go through that process together. Yeah. Uh, so that's one dynamic. And then you also have two brothers working alongside one another. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. So, you know, they all pose their own challenges because their personalities are very different, but they're both very passionate. And when you put two passionate people in a room that have difference of opinion, that can go sideways. So right. Right. I become a little bit of the mediator, <laughs> a little bit of the dad and a little bit of the boss. So, yeah. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I can tell you. Yeah. It's, it, it's just uh, amazing. Every day I drive in the parking lot and I see their, they get here before I do. That's one of the, <laughs> That's one the, of the benefits of being the dad and the boss. Right. <laughs> um, but when I see their cars in the parking lot, before I walk into the office, I get excited to know that they're there. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and they're traveling, you know, they're traveling now and they're going to meet people and, and meet the consumers and, 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 and say a little bit tobacconist, our partners. And when they're not here, I miss them. And if yeah. they're here, I tell them you need to be on the road. So it's a little bit of a mixed message, but you know, it's both. Well, and not just not just the you know the the joy uh, and the and the learning experience of being able to work alongside them and mentor them and and guide them, but also to see them because they they've had good success early on. You know, and they've worked very hard for that success. You know, I was fortunate to get to meet both of them and talk to both of them at, at the trade show back when I was with uh, with Blind Man's Puff. And and I was so fortunate and, and grateful to be able to just stand and talk to them for a little while because you can really see not just the passion, but the the drive and the dedication that they have to it, because passion will only take you so far, like yeah. you said. And the, but they, you can tell that they have the drive and the dedication and for them to have success with blind faith and then follow up success with gatekeeper is it, it's, it says that there's, there's more to it than just that, that they are obviously not just which you wouldn't allow. I guarantee you wouldn't allow. They're not just riding daddy's coattails. They are actually creating their own things. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I told them both when they got in the business is you have to decide if you're going to be Alan's kids or you're going to be Alec and Brown. That's huge. Yeah. And and if I'm doing the work and you're standing beside me, you're always just going to be Alan's sons. Yep. And that's no way to go through life. You have to have your own identity. And in doing that, one of the things that I wanted them to do, because I wanted them to feel the struggles. I wanted them to understand the process. I wanted to have for them to have some skin in the game. So they had to invest their own money in blind faith. That was their first launch. Yeah. So I said, if it does well, you guys make more money at the end. And if yeah. it doesn't do well, you've lost your investment. And something yeah. that I, I've done personally on both sides. So 
I wanted them to feel it. I wanted them to not just be passionate about it, but to understand it when it came to the, the blend in itself, the artwork that went along with it, the pricing structures that went along with it, how they were going to deliver it to the market. What was the message? All of those things came from that. Yeah. So, I mean, I can tell you one story. They came to me. They, when they both walk into my office together for something that's uncalled, I'm like, what now? What, what is this? And <laughs> they, they came in and they said, dad, we're down to two blends and we want your opinion. And I said, no, I said, <laughs> you guys decide what blends you both agree on. I'll smoke both cigars and I'll come up with my own opinion, but I won't give you that until you've made a decision. Okay. And we were all on the same page. So that's, that's a proud dad moment. Yeah. It was, it was that, it was that moment where they understood that they have to love it, but they have to know that the consumers are going to love it too. And they have to believe in that. And they did. And one of the things we've always talked about is that neither of them should really compromise. They should all, they should both be able to convince the other why it should be one way or another, because yeah. if they compromise, and something doesn't work, they'll always be looking at each, you know, the other brother to say, well, we probably should have done this, or I, I didn't believe in that, and I right. compromised, and I don't want them to do that. So uh, the fact that Blind Faith, exactly how they wanted to do it, um, they opened up, I think, 150 accounts, and that's all they sold to. And the reason is, is I could only give them a certain amount of rollers without hurting our own production. Right, <laughs> right. So uh, I wasn't going to, to, hurt Alec Bradley to make, to give Alec, Alec and Bradley more opportunity. I'm like, you have to earn that. Right. And so then we were able to open up production, give them more rollers as we hired more rollers and train more rollers. Yeah. Uh, and just recently, I think coming up now, Blind Faith is going to open up nationwide. So yeah, I saw that, uh, I saw that announcement today. Yeah. So that was just a decision because we had built, we had, we had trained rollers to roll that blend and giving them the opportunity to be able to ramp up so yeah. that they could they could have a nationwide release on it. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to move forward into discussion about cigar regulations, FDA, mm -hmm. um, Tobacco 21, things like that. Mm -hmm. So in a couple of weeks, we're, we're actually gonna interview Scott Pierce, who's the executive director of PCA. Mm -hmm. on the show. We're very excited to talk to him. Um, and I'm hoping to get some people on uh, from some other um, regulatory agencies and, and consumer agencies as well to, to discuss things like this in the coming months. But there's a lot of movement going on right now. And things are coming to a head with Tobacco 21, with, with the industry as a whole. And what, do you, what are your thoughts on any further pending legislation restrictions, tobacco 21, other forms of regulation. What does a company like yours and and you as a as an ambassador of of cigar culture of of the cigar industry, the premium hand rolled cigar industry, what do you do to um, educate your retailers and your consumers? Because that's we talk so much about that is if every consumer knew just this much more, just one percent more about what was going on with 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 people trying to regulate what they do, we'd be a lot better off. So, what it what do you do when you're faced with challenges like that to help get the word out to your retailers and, and your consumers? You would think that the retailers on their own would want to be more involved, yeah, and, and be up to date on the information. And sometimes maybe it's not as readily available, but between PCA and CRA, they can get all the information they need. And probably both those organizations need to do a better job at disseminating the information. But I mean, I can tell you, I sit on the board of, of CRA. Um, I sit on the advisory board for PCA. So there's a lot of information. And, and even though people want to be involved to a certain level, I can tell you that I'm probably on the phone having nothing to do with my company, but just for the industry, probably three hour phone calls three days a week, um, just going over where are we on litigation? Where are we on the legislation part of it? Where does the money have to go? How are we going to raise the money? And people want to be involved and there are ways for them to do that. 
but I'm not sure that most, let's say the other cigar manufacturers want to spend 12, 15, 20 hours a week, every single week going over the hot topics of the moment. Uh, but there are ways for them to be involved. One is every consumer should be a member of CRA. If they love smoking cigars, they need to be a part of the organization, have their signatures on board. Um, when you join that money, every almost every bit of the money that you get with a membership goes towards our either litigation efforts or our legislative efforts. And we just need we need a bigger footprint. We need yeah. more people involved. And one of the so um, to play devil's advocate here when it when it comes to um, groups like CRA and PCA, you know, um, for for how about that cigar being media members? We're we're members of PCA, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just you know. <laughs> We, we joke sometimes in cigar media and Coop jokes about it. Sometimes we're just here for the free samples, but everybody knows that's not true. This is the industry that we care about. It's a culture we care about a lot and that's why we cover it. And, but when it comes to people paying money to these organizations, we pay retailers pay money to PCA uh, mm -hmm. companies like Alec Bradley cigars pay money to PCA uh, media members like us pay money to PCA. Um, and then consumers out there pay money to CRA and uh, possibly other consumer uh, geared organizations to lobby, to get the word out, to raise awareness, to educate, things like that. And when, again, playing devil's advocate here, mm -hmm. when something comes along like Tobacco 21 that passes and there's so much background apathy that and and all of a sudden it, it passes and everybody's like what the hell just happened a, a question that i ask is devil's advocate to the, to both the cra and pca is what the hell are we paying you for and i it's say a, that again as devil's advocate i'm it's not a great question pod, but but what the hell are we paying you for and so when when things like this pass and everybody raises their shoulders and goes what the hell's going on talk a little bit about that about you know, how things like this that we're seemingly fighting so hard still end up going through. Okay. So, so I, I understand the question. I think it's a great question. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Right. Yeah. If we're all contributing on some level, what are you doing? And I'm going to ask the same question to Scott in a couple of weeks, by the way, which is great. Uh, and I don't know what his answer is going to be, but tobacco 21 was a political measure and, and that's way bigger than us. And what I mean by that is you have giant, vape interest, e-cig interest, and they know they're coming under regulation. So the best thing that could happen is to say, look what we're giving you. We're going to give you tobacco 21 so that no one under the age of 21 can legally purchase tobacco products. That they had to give so that we could look at the other regulations and strictly pertaining to the premium cigar business. Okay. And that is, we're not marketing to teens. We right. have scientific studies, uh, what's called the Path 3 Wave Study, that shows youth, us youth usage for premium cigars is minuscule. It's almost nothing. Yeah. So the Tobacco 21 is something that as a premium cigar segment, we endorsed. We were okay with it because that's not our market. And we don't want to be lumped in with cigarettes and e-cigs and vape. Okay. which is who that truly affects. But where our fight is, is what's going on with the premium business with substantial equivalence that's coming up that we have to have applications in for literally every SKU, over 50,000 SKUs, I believe, yeah. that are going to go into the FDA. And they can't handle it. And we're trying to get some regulatory relief right now. Okay. Right? We're, but that was so way past... PCA, CRA, that that was a political measure to say, look, we're doing something. And it doesn't really affect the premium cigar business. And what about, would you call it rhetoric when they say things like, but premium cigars are on the low point of the totem pole for, uh, for fines and for, you know, our attention to this bill? Is that just rhetoric or... 
you know, what, what do you take from that? I, I believe that to be real. I don't think it's rhetoric at all. I, I think what happens is, is that there's the FDA has a certain amount of resources and the, their big issue is youth usage. And because there's the youths are not smoking premium cigars, that is very low on the totem pole. But that's still not enough, right? What they're saying is we're going to regulate you, but we're not really, we don't know about the enforcement yet. We don't know what it all means yet. And if you look at some of the uh, some of the information that came out just last week, they basically you know stated and they cited um, all these studies pertaining to e-cigs and vape. And yet when it came back and said, we understand premium cigars are different, they're kind of low priority for us. They didn't they didn't really even mention a study as to why they came up with that. But we do have the science. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have the data to show that really the the juice isn't worth the squeeze. The amount of money that the FDA would have to put forth, the health benefits not there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's our fight. And it still puts manufacturers and retailers kind of in this uh, weird position where the regulation is there. Yes, they've said, you know, yep, it's there, but we're really, you know, you guys are low on the totem pole. It's kind of this weird limbo um, place. Where do we go from here? I, I think that it's, um, I think ultimately we need to force their hand on some level, right? We need some kind of a decision as to where we stand because you could stay in this no priority or low priority situation until what the next administration, if it changes, that all of a sudden becomes a priority. Um, you, you don't know. So we are continuing to fight. I mean, I can tell you right now that CRA and PCA pretty much split the bills when it comes to the litigation. Okay. We've been billed over, over $4.5 million in legal fees. So if you look at how that gets split, PCA, their revenue driver is the trade show mm -hmm. and they pay half the bills. CRA is just a bunch of small, you know, a bunch of companies, really nine of us that pay the bulk of the balance. Yeah. So, and I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I think there were nine companies that just had to put out, you know, $70,000 each, just write a check to pay for legal fees. And, and, and actually, and one retailer, uh, Gary Pesh from, from uh, Old Virginia, I mean, put up money. So we, we need more people involved. We need a lot of the um, newer manufacturers that are making headway, that are having great success. They need to start ponying up, you know, 20000 or 25000 or $30,000 and get involved. If they want to be involved on a daily basis, which I think is great, and I invite them to do that. They have to be prepared, though, to be put 10, 12, 15 hours, 20 hours a week aside to fight the fight for all of us. Yeah. yeah. And how what I mean, it's it's it sounds like an easy question, but I know it's not an easy answer. What how do we how do we shake people out of this? There seems to be too much in my opinion in my observation there seems to be too much apathy from consumers and and retailers and even some brand owners alike there seems to be too much apathy so what are some things we can do together as whether it's consumers media retail brand owners what are some things we can do to encourage and shake people out of this apathy to mm -hmm. participate in the conversation and 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 participate i mean from a like you said a, a financial standpoint. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you also the, the legal fight is not going to go away. The lobbying is not going to go away, right? This is just the beginning. And, and, and again, forget all the legislative efforts. Like I said, over four, over $4.5 million just in legal fees so far. Yeah. And so I think where you guys could be a great service is to ask every brand owner that does an interview with you what are you doing for the industry? Mm -hmm. What, yeah. what, it, how are you contributing to the industry now to say that? Yeah, I go to the trade show 
and part of my funds are used, well, they're not there really for the industry, right? People go to the trade shows so they can show their wares and sell their products and gain exposure and do those things. And I applaud that. But they need to be putting aside a piece of what they're making and make a contribution to the legal fund. I mean, okay. that that would help because there's more we could do. But like I said, when you're just under five million dollars in legal fees and we're at the beginning, the industry needs to come together. Yeah. What do you see? Because there's, um, um, you know, PCA um, before that IPCPR, before that RTDA, you know, the, the, the big organization that has the, the main industry trade show but mm -hmm. as people are learning gradually there are other trade shows there's the the tobacco plus expo that's coming up in a few weeks mm -hmm. um what do you see because that's a little bit different it's it, it's actually owned by uh you know owned by a tobacco company so they have they have somewhat of a vested interest in it but what do you see first of all is is your company going to participate in that trade show and have you in the past and where do you see smaller organizations like that smaller trade shows do you see that becoming more prevalent in the future? And do you think that's something that could be helpful? Uh, we are going to participate in TPE this year. We have okay. not done it in the past. Um, it's a bit of a look-see for us to see, yeah. you know, what goes on. Does it make sense? Is it the consumers? Is it the tobacconist that we're looking for? You have to remember as a, as a cigar manufacturer, we don't really sell, we don't sell to consumers. We market to consumers, but we right. sell to tobacconists. Right. Yep. And so we think that even though those shows are great because they bring people together and it creates more interest and more excitement in the premium cigar segment, I, I think that people aren't understanding that this monstrous undertaking that we have in front of us, that if we don't find a way, whether it's through TPE or through the PCA show, to support the industry and what we're doing and, and the legislative efforts and the pressure we need to put on the White House, that all costs money. If they don't get involved in that, the chances of some of the newer manufacturers, you know, staying in business, that, that diminishes quite rapidly. Yeah. And that's that's one of the things that we see in um, so many different businesses. I mean, it could be um, premium cigars, obviously, what we deal with, but but craft breweries, craft distilleries, um, uh, small companies that make, you know, uh, gourmet foods and who it could be anything. Mm -hmm. The smaller companies are the ones that that they they tend to suffer first mm -hmm. and are at the highest risk of of all out failure just because the cost of doing business becomes prohibitive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that one of the reasons that I encourage people that we encourage people to try a whole spectrum of cigars from inside the humidor at their shops is because you could, you know, the, the, the brands that have been around for years, like your, like your own, those are great brands and, and we should support the brands that we love, but spend a dollar or two now and again to support a brand that you've never bought before, because it could be contributing to, you know, keeping maybe maybe the next, um, m not necessarily the next big thing, but, you know, a, a, another company that's going to grow into a medium sized company and then grow into a large company that could, you know, um, be very active in this this uh, um, this work that everybody's doing to try to fight regulation and um, and and overreach from governmental agencies. Yeah, I mean, this is when, when you're contributing to the legislative effort um, or or the, uh, the you know all the legal battles. If you're contributing, you're really just investing in your in your own company, okay. And what happens is, as a business owner, your job is to become sustainable, is is to be able to be you know around year over year. So yeah. if you do everything right as a business owner, and yet the industry goes away. What did you do? Right. Yep. That's an excellent point. Yep. So, you know, if you, instead of taking your next vacation or buying your next watch or doing those things, there you, go. you should take that money and put it towards your sustainability as a company in an industry. So, I mean, I, I can tell you there are companies, uh, including ours, that have put hundreds of thousands of dollars that nobody talks about 
but hundreds of thousands of dollars into paying for lobbyists and, and, and to get our message across. By the way, one of the reasons that we are on the bottom of that priority list is not by accident. Do you think they just came up with this epiphany like, ah, don't worry about premium cigars? No, we had to get the message out to the Congress, to senators, to White House staff, that we're not the same as other tobacco products. We're an all natural yeah. product. We're made by hand. Yeah. We are premium. We're not found in convenience stores. You know, that's not who we are. We don't market to kids. Right. We're different and we should be treated differently. But that message doesn't happen by accident. That's a message right. that we've had to pay to get told. And I, I agree that that is the, that is the most important message. And that's something that what you see with a lot of legislation, regardless of what area it covers, whether it could cover anything, uh, any type of legislative yeah. measure, there tends to be uh, from the from the politicians themselves, from the lawmakers themselves, because I I, I get it, they're busy, whatever. But the, there's there's a lot of laziness that goes into these the these bills that cover broad swaths of of uh, product types. Mm -hmm. And they they take a word like alcohol. What if we're talking about beers and distilled spirits and things like that? They take the word alcohol and they lump it all together into one big thing. And they they're doing the same thing, with, or hopefully we're veering them away from that. But for the longest time, they did the same with tobacco products. It's got mm -hmm. the word tobacco in it. It's all in the same thing. It's all Correct. it's all the same. It affects people the same way. It affects kids the same way. It affects health the same way. All that stuff. And the fact is, that's just not true. Like you said, it's scientifically proven over and over and over again in peer-reviewed studies that it's not the case. Premium hand-rolled cigars are what? 0.09% of all smokable tobacco products. And it, it is 0.001% of all tobacco usage and 0.03% oh, and 3% of all cigars. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's in, in, in some scientific methods, it becomes... It, it it actually becomes statistically irrelevant. Correct. And so, therefore, if the government does what's called a cost benefit analysis, that's that what it's going to cost to regulate and what are the benefits? It's not there. Right. And hopefully it, I, I am, although tobacco 21 was a shock to a lot of people, mm -hmm. I am seeing the, the, the compass shift as far as, premium cigars finally and hopefully actually written on paper and approved on paper as their own separate group of products. And that is the, that is so vital to this culture and this industry is that is that premium hand rolled cigars get separated out as their own product category. So by definition, by definition, right on paper, it's got to be on paper and approved. And that is one of the legal battles now that we're yeah. fighting. Yeah. yeah. And how important is projects like uh, the hand rolled movie to be a voice and an advocate for this industry? Yeah. I mean, anytime you could bring eyeballs to our industry and to see what we do and the passion behind it and who, who our clientele is. Yeah. That all tells a story and, and we can't tell enough stories, right? We're limited in what we do to be able to tell a lot of stories. So I think that's a, a great component for who we are uh, as yeah. an industry. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so we're going to shift a little bit. Um, thanks very much for, for giving a lot of in-depth insight into that, uh, that topic, because it's, it's really, there, there's so many layers to, to the regulative side of it. And, and I, I know that you're deeply involved in it and we very much appreciate your insight with that. I, I can't wait to hear your, your interview with Scott. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to him. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and you could bring, you should ask uh, Glenn Liu, uh, yeah. who, who leads up, you know, CRA. He's, yeah, he's, he's uh, extremely he's knowledgeable on my list of people to reach out to. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we're going to shift into um, what we call smokabulary. And these are, you know, for those of you guys out there in the cigar world, there are a lot of, you know, strange words that we use in the cigar world that uh, a lot of people don't know what the heck we're talking about. Um, but um, when I, I sent Garrett a message today and I said, what should we do for smokabulary today? And Garrett hit me with a word that I absolutely hate, but we're going to do this anyway. We're going to, we're going to power through it 
and I'm going to try as hard as I can to not go off on a 40 minute rant. And the word this this week's smokabulary word is plume. I hate this word with a passion because it is one of the most deeply misunderstood and misused words in in the history of the of the world of premium hand rolled cigars. So is plume is plume green? Is but yes, plume <laughs> plume is green. And it's it's typically in big green splotches, and it can, it can grow on the boxes or the cellophane, or yeah, it's okay. So, so plume is is a term that we hear you know thrown around a lot. Um, sometimes uh, some retailers will use it as a sales tactic. Sometimes they won't. I applaud those who don't. Um, but these are my opinions, and these are not the opinions of anyone else. These are my opinions. But it's also there's also science behind it, and mm -hmm. there's there's uh, if there, there's a web forum called friendsofhabanos.com. Yes, and there's a thread on that web forum where a a laboratory actually had people send in cigars to them that that the the owner of that cigar was convinced that the the material on that the the white haze on the outside of that cigar was plume. And they said, please send us those cigars. We're going to scientifically test that substance on the outside of that cigar. And we're going to tell you what it is. And in every example sent in, there was not one single cigar tested. And they have they even have a reward that they will give you something like five hundred dollars worth of vintage Cuban cigars or something like that. Uh, if you if you ever uh, for the one person who ever sends in a cigar that's that's free of mold. And there was not one cigar ever tested to this day, and they've tested hundreds, I think, to this point. That has that was uh, the test results were shown to be completely free of mold. Now, we've and Garrett and I covered this briefly in a show earlier last year. Yep, plume is a real thing. Yes, plume exists, and Alan can talk about this too. Plume, plume is their it, tobacco leaves have oils in them, and over time. If stored properly, and even sometimes if stored improperly, those oils come to the surface of the wrapper leaf and they crystallize. And if it's if it's aged properly, they will have this lovely sort of dusting, dusting of haze of this substance on the outside of the wrapper leaf. And you think, what the hell is that? Now, if 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 a cigar has plume on it. Every single time, there will also be mold present. Correct. But it is possible to have a cigar that has mold on it that contains no plume. Very so, correct. So basically, it comes down to this. More likely. All plume contains mold, but not all mold contains plume. So... If A equals B, if A equals B, <laughs> yeah. So we're, uh, and and again, I could. I, uh, this is a subject that makes me crazy in the head. But I have cigars in my collection that have plume on them. But I know for an absolute fact that there's also traces, and it could be very small traces of of certain types of mold. And there's a very specific type of because there are basically in, in you know in the world there are. Um, 12 common types of mold that we see on a daily basis. And the one that you see on cigars, let me find this on my notes. The one that you find on cigars is, is called uh, aspergillus or aspergillus. I don't know how you pronounce it exactly. Now out in, in the world of aspergillus mold, there are 183 strains of aspergillus mold. Now, in that study they did on Friends of Habanos, there were multiple of those 183 strains of aspergillus found. But aspergillus is not really a harmful mold. It's the same kind of mold you'll see when they ferment uh, uh, soy sauce, when they ferment other fermented foods kombucha. and things like kombucha. The, the, these are molds that are consumable. Yep. They're edible. They're not harmful in small quantities. So mm -hmm. if you've got a cigar that's got plume on it, more power to you. Smoke it. Enjoy it. But if you've got a cigar that has these big green splotchy flowers on it, that's not plume. Nope. And uh, so, that's, that's you know, great. for me, <laughs> yeah. 
That's I'm gonna, great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Matt off his uh, soapbox for a little bit. Let him <laughs> breathe. Um, for me, the the times where you see true plume, you could blow it off of the cigar. You could literally blow most of that plume off. But if it's mold, it doesn't blow off because mold has roots. It it, it needs to to feed on or sink in or take it has root. To, it has to attach. It has to attach. So if you can't blow it off or lightly wipe it off, that's mold. And um, while a little bit of mold can be perfectly okay, a good sign sometimes of uh, a well-aged cigar, um, some cigars won't plume. Some cigars don't have enough oil to develop that plume and they don't age that way. Um, so if it doesn't blow off and if it doesn't easily wipe off, that's mold. That's not always bad, but like Matt said, if it's green or if it's a bluish or real fuzzy white, or if it's on the foot, if it's on the foot <laughs> or if it's yeah. on the outside of the cellophane, or if it's on the box, or if it's on the shelf in the, in the walk-in humidor in a cigar shop, get rid of it. You run out of that cigar shop and don't ever go there again. Yep. And if it's in your humidor and you've got. A lot of mold happening i would you know i think it's easier to get a new humidor if it's not that bad you can uh, ammonia uh wipe down your humidor and start over yeah but it can ruin an entire humidor if uh if you've got a mold problem so alan give us your give us your two cents on plume <laughs> i thought that was great and matt you should be <laughs> proud that you didn't get all 40 minutes of a rant in. um but also lighter wrappers generally don't possess as much oil, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you're seeing it on a lighter wrapper, there's a good chance it's it's mold. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, right, normally you'll see it, you'll, you'll see that white powdery substance on a darker, thicker wrapper where the oils are more prevalent. Correct. Um, as a cigar manufacturer, I think if you have cigars that have aged so much they have plume, you're not smoking enough cigars. Yeah. So, Amen. <laughs> probably need to smoke them a little quicker. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I think it's a cool thing, but I don't actually think it changes the experience. I don't necessarily think it changes the flavor in any yeah. way. So yeah. yep. if you see it and it's a, a cool thing and sit back and enjoy your cigar and know that it's well-rested and well-aged, and I think that's a, a great part of just that overall experience. Yeah. But uh, other than that, I mean, very interesting that you're bringing this up right now because we did a test uh, six months ago with a new humidification pack that people were testing out. And we put 50 cigars randomly in a sealed case to see how this new humidification pack would hold. And someone, when they opened it up, said, oh, look at all the plume. And I'm like, uh, listen, <laughs> it's a good try. Um, <laughs> But that's not plume, and you could wipe the cigars off of the mold and still smoke it if you'd like. But I'm I'm yeah. good right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, and I mean, I've, it's a cool thing. I've had experience, and you've probably we've probably all had experiences where, you know, a friend of ours or a family member, you know, they're they're really excited, and I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cut down their excitement if they hand me a cigar and say. I want I, I just wanted to give this to you. I wanted to give this to you as a gift and I want you to smoke it and enjoy it because I've been aging this for a long time and it's got this great coating of plume on it. I just say thank you and That's I right. if, if and I wipe it off and I smoke it. Right. It's exactly you be and gracious I, and clean it up and, and smoke it. Yeah. yeah. And I've had some great cigars that have had, you know, uh traces of mold on mm -hmm. it before. And absolutely and I as long if as long as it's not like I said, you know, growing flowers or anything, I that's yeah. fine. I I have no problem with it at all. I just, you know, it's I I just want people to know actually what they're smoking, and I want I want retailers to stop using that word <laughs> because I don't think it uh, it doesn't serve the consumers well. Uh, no, and and the truth is, if then the consumers are looking only for cigars that have plume right it's gonna very much limit their ability to go out yeah. and try cigars well yeah. and this not not the shop that we're in now because the, the the humidor at this shop is immaculate but there there was a shop in the twin cities area that <laughs> that i i i had a, a a folder filled with photographs on my phone years ago 
uh, that you would go into this humidor and just, it was so sad. I mean, it was, it, it, it looked like a, a, a horticulture experiment. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was horrifying. I mean, it was all, it was so, some of the most beautiful cigars from Alec Bradley and, and Fuente and Padrones that were just absolutely covered Destroyed. with the thickest, heaviest, furriest mold you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. Yeah. And the everybody who worked there, including the owner, would swear up and down that's plume that's plume and that i haven't stepped foot into that shop in over 10 years i think well, yeah it, it, it happened to that shop in in the meantime but the sad part is is i actually helped out that owner quite a bit in the early stages and tried to educate and um that you know all that education really fell on deaf ears and i had to i had to walk away because after sending him a picture of you know something saying you know these cigars are ruined and should be off the shelf and his reply to me was these are the best those are well aged yeah and generally that happens um you know in a in a commercial humidor when someone wants to keep the humidity very high and doesn't take care of the temperature right right so it's it's kind of warm and it, it creates an atmosphere of warm and wet for the mold to to grow and, yeah. they're, and they're using, you know, uh, a Walmart or a, you know, Home Depot humidifier with tap water. <laughs> you know, it's really sad how often I see those uh, those humidifiers just, you know, putting out this thick cloud of <laughs> haze of dirty water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you have to know that, right? Most most tobacconists, uh, the majority of them care and they're professional right. and, absolutely 100 percent. yeah they take good care of their products 100 percent. yeah the yeah. issues that you see in in walk-in humidors in in shops are fortunately the the exception instead of the the rule uh, and, and, and by the way the more consumers know absolutely. right the more that the tobacconists have to be held accountable for their their product yep so yeah I, th I think it's i think it's great and and i can tell you in in uh, Ninety-nine percent of the tobacconists that I have visited around the world, they truly care about the experience to the consumer. Agreed. Yeah. So most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. So let's move into my favorite segment of every single show: Numero, Numero de los Muertos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. The number this this week is 25 a year on average people die from this however in 1993 a unusual thing happened and a hundred people died from this uh, between the places of milwaukee and minneapolis minnesota so on average 25 people a year would die from this mm -hmm. between Milwaukee and Minneapolis. No, no, no. Oh, uh, um, North America. North America. Okay. But in 93, just a, an unusual thing. I'll talk about the details after we figure out what this is. A uh, hundred people died between Milwaukee and the Twin Cities. From this same thing. From the same thing. What makes, well, it's cold between Milwaukee and Minneapolis. Because we're here right now. I think it's 10 degrees outside. Love that. Okay. And uh, another hint. This happens between April and October. Uh, so normally 25 people a year mm -hmm. uh, in North America. Mm -hmm. April and October. And sadly... The uh, the victims of this are small children. Are, are the majority of those who uh, fall victim to this? Uh, it's not heat stroke, is it? No, sir. Um. So think of. Uh, I'm gonna keep going with some hints. Think of wildlife that are more prevalent during that time period and maybe wildlife that leave during the, the uh, months of November through March. 
bear attack? What was that? Maybe a, a, a bear attack or, you know. Mm, bears? Oh, is uh, it that bears? Are hibernating? No, it is not bears. It's not bears, but it is. Bears eat beets. Bears eat beets. Is it? But it's an animal. It is an animal, kind of. Kind, okay. Well, I should say it. Um, an animal is responsible. Or it's byproduct. It's the Easter Bunny. Not the Easter Bunny. Not the Easter Bunny. Not the Easter Bunny. Um, no. Is it uh, a mammal? Mm -mm. It's not a mammal. Is it a animal that lives in the water? Mm. A fish. Mm -mm. It's not a fish. Uh, You'll find this animal um, around lakes and streams, ponds, and then they go away in late October, they, November. They go away? Mm hmm And then they come back. Frogs? Nope. What animal in this area? Oh, shit. I don't know. Let's, you got uh, me let's, stumped this time. Like, seriously stumped. Let's say migrate. Birds. Ge geese? Canada geese. Canada. What, so what was so special about 93 that shot the number up to 100? So here's the deal. Um, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Canada geese feces is extremely toxic especially to young children and and the elderly it uh contains a special strain of e coli plume does it does it, it has plume, plume. <laughs> yep it has plume on there. <laughs> um and in 1993 a uh, just a really crazy wild strain a super strain of e coli um hit canada geese that um they got in mexico and okay. brought back up here when they when they migrated back yeah um to the north um and interestingly enough i worked uh with the canada goose program at the university of minnesota okay uh, during this period of time and um uh what people don't realize is uh canada geese were were brought into this area and to like everything else, right? Um, it was to help with a certain insect that that. So technically, it's an invasive species. Kind of, it was it was an indigenous species to this area, yeah. but more were brought in to help control a um, a grass eating um, insect. People weren't getting the the lawns that they liked in the fifties and sixties. Must have been the FDA. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so the U of M started this program called the Canada Goose Program and started uh, relocating geese to Kansas, Arkansas, um, and banning them and finding only a 40% return rate um, hmm. from relocation. But that wasn't good enough. They closed their borders. Okay. Long story short, we put them on the, uh, 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 started disbanding geese and putting them on food shelves in Canada. Okay. Because Americans were too good to, <laughs> to eat geese. Yeah. And um, PETA threatened to bomb our house. <laughs> so that was fun. Well, I've always found PETA to be a very level-headed and, and measured organization Absolutely. myself. Absolutely. That was sarcasm, by the way, if you didn't catch that. Um, okay, so that's uh, this. So, so the lesson from this week's Numero de los Muertos is stay away from goose poop and and in all reality it is a it is a, a genuine good uh psa uh for those with uh toddlers and younger when you're at the beach when you're at a park and there's geese around um if you see a lot of goose poop steer clear yeah and uh you know kind of uh give a, a little heads up to local authorities because it is dangerous yeah and that's not mold it's plume it is plume <laughs> goose plume goose plume so alan uh, a couple <laughs> rapid fire questions here um a little bit outside of the norm if you could hear the thoughts of one living person for 10 minutes 
who would it be and why? I would think at this point it would be our president. You're the second guest yeah, to say that. Yeah, you're the second yeah. guest to give that answer. That's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because you'd have to, I think I'd want to understand um, if he's just a, if he's a genius or he has no clue what he's doing, but I, I would, I would, I would think it, I'd like to understand, the, I guess, the rationale behind the decisions and how he goes about it. Yeah. Uh, and if not, potentially, I would say Bill Belichick. Ooh. Oh, that's a great answer. Oh, yeah. He, uh, yeah. Just to, just to understand the methodology as of how he's put winning teams together year over year and how he creates mismatches. What does he look for? Yeah. You know, what does that all mean? And where, do, where does he place the video cameras just right to get, no, I'm joking. Yeah. yeah. Well, that wasn't them. That was the craft no. video company that's a yeah. separate entity. And he knew nothing about yeah, it. Yeah, he knew nothing about that whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. So... <laughs> Alan, if you were about to get into a fight, what soundtrack music would come on? It'd easy to say Rocky, right? Yeah. I yeah, think it I'm would not... be uh, Big Papa by Biggie Smalls. Oh, wow. that's a great answer. That's a great answer. That Two would be of my favorite answer. That, that would be great soundtrack mu music for a fight. That would be, and it's probably, I got to go back and look, look at movies that that song's been in, but I bet that's been used in it in a fight scene before. Um, so choose one of the following, Alan. You could hit a home run as a starting pitcher. You could score a touchdown as a defensive lineman, or you could score a goal in a hockey game as a goalie. Oh, definitely, definitely door number three. Hockey goal. Hockey goal. Hockey goalie. Yeah. 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 That's like the rarest of the rare. I mean, yeah, it's, it's only been done in, you know, a handful of times in history. Yeah. I just, I, I just think that, uh, you know, your, your job is if you have the puck is to clear it, but to, to, to have the guts to go out and take that shot. Yeah. I think that's it. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to new cigar consumers, what would it be? Uh, try everything. Yeah. I think there's a lot of great cigars in the market. Yeah. Um, I would say try not to be as influenced as many new consumers are and utilize your own palate to decide what you like. And you really can't do that unless you pick up something that you like and pick up one or two others that you haven't tried before and, and just create, create your own, you know, happy place. Try everything. Yeah. And if you, uh, and I know you do this a lot, but um, what's the what's the number one piece of advice that you give to cigar retailers? Uh, customers first. Customers first, yeah. Customers first. Just make sure the consumer experience is everything and more. Yeah. Um, and um, because, and I know you do this as well because you uh, uh, you work directly with them. But um, what are piece of pieces of advice? Let's say, take yourself out of it. Let's say you were not directly a, a contributor. What would be the number one piece of advice you would give to the PCA? Um, be more inclusive. Okay. Mm, be more okay. inclusive. Um, call the entire industry together. Yeah. Uh, every, every person that shows on the show floor and every tobacconist needs to know what we're doing and why. And the more inclusive you become, the easier it is to disseminate the message and get more people involved and get more people excited about the fight that we're fighting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to move into notable smokables. Mm. Uh, Alan, we talked about it a little before the show. Garrett and I briefly just mentioned a few cigars that we've smoked over the last uh, week or two uh, that were interesting. They could be new to the market, old to the market. It doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm just going to start quickly. I had... Um, uh, the the new Roma Craft Baca. Oh, um, dude! And uh, it took me a while Jealous. to finally get around to trying it, and um, I was I was pretty impressed with it. I I uh, I am a big fan of Cameroon wrappers, um, and you're always curious how uh, how a new brand is going to handle a, a Cameroon wrapper, and uh, I was impressed. I think they I I think it it speaks as it smokes as a Cameroon wrapper. 
and um, I think that definitely comes through. It's the little pygmy size, which actually that that small, I think it's uh, like a four by 48 size, uh, which I'm a fan of in, in a number of their blends, but I think that size works well. Um, I haven't tried the larger ones, the larger sizes yet, but I think they did a good job with that blend. And for me, my first one is uh, Leaf by Oscar released the uh, Lancero uh, Maduro. Oh, okay. And it is uh, it is dirty and <laughs> yummy, uh, yeah. very toothy, um, just a, a great, great smoke. Yeah. Uh, Alan, what's something that piqued your interest recently, whether it was your own brand or somebody else's? Yeah, I just smoked a cigar called La Estancia, which is uh, from the Mirafeld family out in Belgium. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I was so impressed. I actually just called uh, Jeremiah and I spoke with him yesterday and just said, you know, it's like something I've never smoked before. Um, I thought it was fantastic. So nice. Is that one only available over in that area? Uh, avail yeah, it's in available in Europe now. Yeah. Uh, and actually, there were some boxes that were brought back. Bradley, when he was in Europe working, uh, brought some product back, and he's the one who really introduced me to it. And but recently, I've smoked the other sizes, and uh, I thought it was great. I thought it was yeah. it was very different from anything I've smoked on the market. Nice. Nice. I love finding stuff that's unique. Uh, that's one of my, because, you know, cigars uh, are what they are and they, they, there are, uh, you know, they're, they're typically a set parameter of, you know, different flavor profiles and types and things like that. And mm -hmm. it's always fun to find something that kind of sits outside of that and gives you a unique experience. Alan, uh, somebody asked what, uh, what are you sipping on? Uh, my, my, it's my regular, it's Glenfiddich 15. 15 Glenn, love yeah it. love it yeah that's uh, uh i think if i someone had asked me if you were on a on a desert island yet one whiskey to drink the rest of your life what would it be it'd be glenfiddich 15 it's balanced it's got yeah. some sweet natural sweetness to it uh and it's consistent yeah great choice and it's not a it's not as overly expensive whiskey either um no, and, and you have to know uh, William Grant and Sons, which is uh, Belvini and and Glenfiddich. You know, it was it was actually Mr. Grant himself who is the one who brought single malts uh, to 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 be what they are today. He was their first. He was the originator of single malt whiskey. Yeah, and um, they're they're a great family. They're fifth now, sixth generation coming in. Um, they're not beholden to shareholders. Yeah. yeah. So it's and and I just spent some time with uh, with the owner, and she said we don't really even own the brand. We're a custodian for the next generation. I thought that was a great statement. Yeah. Something that we uh, that now I aspire to, right? Is to oh yeah hold our brand at a certain level so that Alec and Bradley have something to build upon. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And every time I hear Glenn anything, I always think of the movie Swingers. What I don't know it? if you remember the movie swingers I, but uh I, I remember it i don't remember anything about uh i forget the actor's name but he he uh is in a casino and you know they ask you know what he wants to drink he said glenn levitt glenn Gle you know what any glenn will do any glenn will do <laughs> <laughs> um so uh my my other um notable smokable this week was the la gloria cubana spanish press Ooh. um and it was a um, I, if I remember right, I I want to say it's it's it was sort of a, a shelved release for for La Gloria Cubana, and they brought it back last year. I could be wrong about that. It could be a brand new release. I honestly don't recall exactly, but um, I mean it's this is truly a square cigar. I mean it's 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 pretty much a perfect sharp square. Edges. It's sharp edges, uh, but but the the two or three uh, that i smoked uh, it was a uh, it was a good release from uh, from general cigar so mm -hmm. i i did enjoy that cigar and uh my last one is uh the uh toothpick oh the uh jsk jsk was it the habano or it the was Maduro? the habano yeah and uh damn it that is a good cigar it is it is good it's inexpensive and it's an inexpensive you know um i'm always on the lookout for a great inexpensive uh, tasty treat. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Alan, what? Anything else that uh, that pops into your head from the last? Yeah, couple of weeks? yeah. I was uh, I was over at Fuente's place in Tampa, um, and uh, was given a, a cigar from Carlos, uh, the the Don Carlos, which I absolutely oh, love. Yeah, 
classic. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a go-to. I mean, it's it's they're they're so consistent um, over years and decades, and it's uh, it's a cigar that I think most humidors find uh, uh, some among their best sellers. I would I would imagine. Yeah, and and, and I'm just telling you, and I know you said whether it's mine or not, but this year's fine and rare. Like I said, it's probably, mm. I think the best cigar we've ever made. Yeah. And, and this is a cigar that the slower you smoke it, the more you get out of it. Um, it's just, it's just special. It's, yeah. it's just balanced and it's flavorful and, uh, it's everything that we thought it would, that we wanted it to be and more. And even though it's sold out, if someone has a chance to pick that up, I would suggest that they try that. Yeah. Now we don't want you to give away any secrets, but um, can you, yeah, give, you do. give our well? We do, we definitely do, but <laughs> we won't ask you directly to. But okay. can you give our listeners and viewers an idea that uh, you know that they're that uh, the company is working on some uh, some interesting things uh, that we can see in 2020? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you first and foremost that Alec and Bradley are coming out with another release. Okay. Uh, they have worked diligently, literally day after day, um, and recently agreed on a, a blend that they had been working on. And so I look forward to seeing that come out. I think that's going to be a great release for them. Um, and actually, there was a point that I said, if you're not going to use that blend, <laughs> I, I, I would like to I'd like to take it. But and I think yeah. that was potentially would push them over the edge. <laughs> um, but I'm looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a great release for them. And then we're working on something as well as Alec Bradley. We're working on something. Uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be quite interesting. It's going to be a new look for us. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's something that I think I've probably worked on for over a year. And I think we're just at the final stages now on the blending of where we want to be. And then we'll start with, the, all the concept back behind it. Nice. And then so. what about, um, so we get mixed responses from, from this question, but what are your feelings on collaborations? Do you have any in the, in the books that you can talk about? Do you, uh, do you, you know, what is your feeling on uh, collaborating? Yeah, I think it's great. I think, I think you have to be a little bit careful as you're reasoning to do the collaboration. Uh, as you know, Alec and Bradley did a collaboration with Ernesto Perez Carrillo. Mm -hmm. um, Ernesto and I have a relationship for over 20 years. Uh, I trusted him yeah. and I knew that when Alec and Bradley went to see him, that it would be a collaboration. It wouldn't be, Hey, here are some blends. I want you to try pick one. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I knew that that would not be the case and that they would have involvement and they did. And what I find interesting about that is that if people who smoke EPC and then smoke Alec Bradley and then they try Gatekeeper, they're like, that's not Alec Bradley and it's not an EPC product. Yeah, It truly was a collaboration. And I think what was cool about that was you had this iconic figure, you know, 30 over 30 years in the business and these two young makers and they all had their ideas. They really had nothing in common yeah. other than the passion of the cigar itself. Yeah. And I think that's what drove that collaboration forward. Nice. So I think I think collabs are cool. I think they can work um, if it's more than just marketing. Yeah, I think it has a chance to be a home run because yeah. you get a lot of ideas together and a lot of kind of back and forth as to what do we want it to be? What were you thinking? What am I thinking? And I think those are I think those are cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, guys. For those of you who have stuck with us this whole time, we're so Thank grateful you. that you spent some time with us this evening as you do every Tuesday night. Um, we want to give you some ideas of what you can expect coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, next week on the 14th, we're going to talk to Nick Melillo from Foundation Cigar Company. Very excited about that. And then as we discussed already, the following week on the 21st, we are going to talk to Scott Pierce, who is the executive director of the Premium Cigar Association, formerly known as the IPCPR and um, we're going to dig into the nitty gritty of what is going on legislatively and uh, see if we can uh, learn how we as consumers can be more active in what's going on out there. I know that PCA is is a trade organization, but they have been making some efforts to become more involved with their consumers as well. And we want to talk about how they're going about doing that. Um, so, Alan, give everybody kind of a final shout on how they can find out more information about Alec Bradley Cigars. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Matt Garrett, thank you. Uh, this has been fun for me. I'm still at the office. It's going on around 11 o'clock and I wouldn't have 
I wouldn't have changed one thing. I really appreciate you giving me the time. Uh, if you want to know more about Alec Bradley, we, we, we keep our alecbradley.com up to date. Uh, it shows the new stuff that's coming out. It tells a lot about our products, sizes, blends, stuff that's out there. So uh, just visit alecbradley.com and, and get anything you need. And if not, you're always welcome to call our offices and speak to somebody and uh, if there's something that you need an answer on. Fantastic. Alan, awesome. we can't thank you enough for spending your uh, Tuesday evening yeah. with us. We know it's late there and we appreciate you giving us the time. We appreciate for, you know, for all of us, the the work and the passion and the dedication that yep. you've put into the industry for the last 20 plus years. And we look forward to great things for you, for your family uh, going into 2020 and beyond. Thank you to you as well. Thanks, guys. And for you watching don't hesitate to leave us questions on the website, howaboutthatcigar.com. You can leave us questions and comments as well on Facebook. And if you ever need to know anything, you can find us right there. And on social media, Twitter and Instagram, at HBT Cigar. Until we see you guys next time, burn cigars. Not bridges. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys.